me first say how happy I am to be here in the ILO. Uh, I mean, I worked, as Tony mentioned, in several agencies, uh, UNCTAD, uh, WIDA, UNICEF, the Economic Commission for Europe, briefly for, very briefly for CEPAL. And I think that my, my life has been blessed because uh, uh, much of the economic thinking uh, in the United Nations at large originates from these agencies. Uh, and I remember that uh, while I was working in 76, 77 in the Economic Commission for Europe, I was spending most of my time here with Rolf, uh, Wouter, and because the ILO was then the leading agency in the development debate. And then, uh, in a way, one could write a book, and then uh, I moved to UNICEF, and then UNICEF basically became a very important uh, actor in the development debate. So, so one could write a book on uh, the rise and fall of uh, the, the, the leading position of United Nations agencies in the development debate. But uh, the fact remains that uh, in the UN there are five or six agencies which are producing uh, original thinking. And uh, thank you, Isabel. Thank you to the Director General of ILO for <coughs> hosting this um, conference. And, uh, and I think that uh, it is very nice to see many friends here. And, uh, and in this way, I feel like I'm in my own family. And in this family, I would like to bring in a little bit of optimism. And you know, now the debate is dominated by Thomas Piketty's uh, book, uh, which says that uh, inequality is rising everywhere. And this is not true. It's rising basically in the OECD group. And these are the country is mainly analyzing. And uh, in order to, if you want to change things, well, you can uh, start from uh, first principles, or you can look at, uh, look around and see if there is anyone who has uh, done things otherwise. And Latin America represents, uh, in a way, a good example of uh, how uh, policy could start to be built. N nothing terribly. Um, radical, but uh, things have changed, and then this is how they've changed. You see, the income inequality in Latin America was in the early 1980s, the highest or the second highest in the world together with uh, uh, one part of Africa, with Eastern and Southern Africa. And uh, during the period of, you know, during the last decade, the inequality kept rising again already from high levels. Uh, and then uh, during the augmented Washington consensus, which is the 90s, more or less, it rose again. And uh, the turning point is around 2002. And then we see that this is the average for the region, but uh, it's not an average uh, with uh, huge variance. Uh, actually, it's an average with the uh, low and declining variance. And so we see that from uh, about 2002, you see inequality starts falling. And it falls uh, very much. It falls basically to in uh, about uh, eight years. It goes back to the level of the early 1980s. And uh, the question is, uh, what causes that? But before we do that, I mean, I mean, the, not all Latin America experience a decline, but the 15 countries out of 18. So basically, the, the vast majority of these countries. Central America had a much smaller decline in inequality. South America, and particularly the southern cone, a much bigger one. And so you go from Nicaragua, which had uh, an increase in inequality of two points during the period 2002-2010, uh, and then you go to Argentina, and where inequality falls by nine points, and Brazil as well. So two very large economies experience a decline in inequality. Now, one could say, well, there is a debate which says, well, that has been, uh, inequality has been declining in Latin America during a period of uh, high commodity prices, uh, easy access to finance, uh, an increased number of Latinos work uh, moving to Spain, to Europe, to the United States, and so on and so forth. So, um, so basically, it's a cyclical effect. And the question is, is it cyclical? So what we did, we plotted also the, the changes in inequality between the year of the crisis, which is 2008 and 2012. And basically, we see that inequality keeps going down. Perhaps there is a slowdown in 2012, 
but uh, this is a panel of 12 con 11 countries. They are the largest, but they are not all, all of them. And then if you take other measures, uh, basically you see that inequality goes down as well. And uh, so it looks like that uh, the decline in inequality in Latin America is more structural than uh, uh, cyclical. Now, uh, during the recent conference in Helsinki, uh, I think it was a month ago or two months ago, it was Marcelo Neri, who was the Brazilian Minister for Strategic Affairs, and basically gave us the data which are updated until July 2014, so until uh, four months ago, three months ago. And that, I mean, is, this is wage inequality, it's not income inequality, but, and then it concerns only five or six of the main cities, but it's quite telling. So uh, it looks like that uh, even up to 2014, for the largest economy of the region, inequality is falling. Now, one could uh, object, uh, uh -huh, but you know, Tony Atkinson, uh, Thomas Piketty, and uh, Emmanuel Saez and others, they're saying, well, these are data based on household budget surveys. And we know well that the distribution you obtain from this uh, information is truncated. The, 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 the top people often they opt out from the survey. So, so if I am uh, a rich man or a, ri a rich woman, I can say, no, 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 uh, I, I'm not obliged to take part into the survey. And the way now people will go around that, including uh, Piketty, uh, Tony Atkinson, uh, uh, Facundo Alvaredo and others, I mean, basically is to reconstruct the top tail of the distribution using tax returns. And fortunately, we have data for three countries and for the last 10 years, which are Uruguay, Colombia, and Argentina, which show that, you see, the dotted line is the genie corrected uh, by the information concerning the tax returns. And you see that it is higher quite a bit, like uh, in the case of Argentina, five or six points. But you see that the trend is not altered, you see. So there is not uh, a change in uh, trend, even if you use the uh, Gini distribution corrected for the share of the top 1% derived from uh, tax returns. So when we find this information, say, ah! so the, there is a level effect, but there is not a trend effect. Mm -hmm. Now, so we are fairly sure that what we found tends to be, uh, stands the proof of uh, different data sources. Now, uh, since, uh, I mean, there's been a quite a, a big debate when in, the, in a new book which we did uh, uh, in honor of Sir Richard Jolly, uh, there is one chapter by Robert Wade. And the, the chapter says, uh, the title of the chapter is, Why is Income Inequality Neglected So Much in uh, the Current Debate? And then he um, quotes four or five people like, uh, Martin Feldstein and, uh, and um, Margaret Thatcher, I mean, some of the neoliberal people, including a Dutch economist who is basically more English than Dutch now, uh, Beuter. And Beuter says, I really, I'm really uh, sorry about people being poor, but I don't care about inequality. So, so there is a debate that uh, what the, the target is, is that you have to reduce poverty and then if you do that through an unequal policy which are inequalizing, it's not so worrying. Now in the case of Latin America, th this is the, the proof that Boiter is wrong. And if you take the, what has happened more or less during the last 10 years, you see that uh, the dark bar represents the decline in poverty, which is due to redistributive policies. And the lighter bar is the amount which is due to growth. So, so if you are in a country with very fast growth but rising inequality, Poverty will not fall too much. And so here, during this, um, you say during the last decade, I mean, it varies from period to period, from country to country, but basically 40% of the poverty decline is due to improvements in, in, in the income distribution. So even if you want to take a narrow perspective of focusing on poverty, then inequality is a, a reduction in equality is essential. Now, the big the question is, uh, what explains the, the inequality in, uh, income inequality in Latin America 2002-2012, and then if, we, if all the countries are like Brazil, then 2014? Now, I think that uh, there are different views. I mean, if you, 
um, talk to like Ricardo Hausmann, who is a well-known uh, uh, Latin American commentator, he says, luck, you know, uh, in, in income inequality has fallen because there were uh, good, uh, the market was characterized by uh, high commodity prices and all that, you know. Other people, they say, well, no, it's not really luck, but it's growth, because Latin America during the last decade more or less had uh, a rate of growth, which uh, I think is, uh, um, Alfredo, slight, correct me if I'm not wrong, but it's slightly higher than uh, even the period of the uh, income, income substituting industrialization. So it's around 4 or 5%. But 5% uh, growth uh, is not necessarily leading, as we shall see, to uh, falling inequality. And the third explanation is public policies. And this is the one which basically I tend to favor, and, and I try to demonstrate why this is true. Now, if you want to be technical, I, mean, I think it's quite complicated to prove convincingly what uh, you have to say. So, uh, so if I have to go to the meeting of the uh, hard-nosed economist, I, this is what I have to say. Now, uh, what type of information you can use? Well, you can use microsurveys, so household budget surveys. But the household budget surveys, they provide some information. They provide information, basically individual characteristics, so family characteristics and all that. Don't tell anything about exchange rates, uh, public spending. Uh, uh, they tell you hardly anything on policies. But they provide you accurate uh, uh, information on what happens at the micro level. So what we did, we decomposed uh, uh, point to point, two surveys uh, between, let's say, 2000 and 2010 for six countries, which uh, you will see that I mentioned. So in this case, you are able to determine whether the decline in the Gini or the rise in the Gini, I think we selected also a country with rising inequality, is due to what? Uh, changes in uh, the distribution of wages, changes in the distribution of capital income, changes in the distribution of transfers, uh, and so on and so forth. And then if since these incomes are distributed in a very unequal way, then of course if you have a fall in the capital share, if you have a rise in the, in the capital share, everything else being equal, this will be unequalizing. It's quite obvious, you know. But then in, in the end, then we don't get the political economy that both my predecessors have, have mentioned here. And so I find many of these uh, uh, decompositions done by uh, people of not my age normally. Normally they're about 27 year old or something like that. Uh, sorry for the younger one. Eh? So basically they ignore the political economy. And then when you want to get uh, high scores and doing your PhD thesis in uh, American universities, what you have to do. But then that does not help you much in terms of uh, uh, deciding what public policy should be. So, so then we link the information coming to that to the, what we call the underlying causes of income inequality based, based on economic theory, political economy, pandemic regression, and sectoral studies. Now, then, of course, we compare if the results of the two, they fit, and more or less, they fit. Now, the decomposition is done this way. I don't want to bother you, but there are some uh, algorithm, like one is by Branko Milanovic, which, uh, who was uh, cited by <coughs> Isabel, in which the changes in the total gene is equal to the changes in the concentration coefficients of the different sources of income, labor income, capital income, transfer income, remittances income, and changes in their own total share and total output. So in a way, we combine the, the micro distributions with uh, changes in labor share versus capital share. And so it seems, it seems complicated, but it's, it's quite, quite simple. Uh, or we can use the Lerman in, in the Tzaki, which is very similar. So you see, we basically rely on six sources of income. U, UW is unskilled uh, wages. Uh, SW is skilled wages, R, R are rents, uh, then uh, RK are capital uh, um, profits, basically. Then TR are transfers, and RE remittances. And then it's good that we have data also on that. And what does it uh, come out of all that? Now, here I plotted the data for two out of the six countries. And then we took Chile and Ecuador. So, and we have the 90s in which inequality rose, and then the 2000s in which inequality fell. And we wrote the political regime which was in power, and then the period exactly considered. And then we saw that uh, in Chile, during the, during the liberal period, the inequality actually was, it was uh, 
uh, Christian Democrat. Inequality rose a little bit, but it fell much late, much more during the second decade. And then we saw that uh, the, the ab absolute changes in, not in the total, in the total genie, but in the wage genie, uh, basically behave in a similar way. It rises during the first period, then it falls during the second period. And we calculated again what was the skill premium, so the ratio of the wages of skilled workers to unskilled workers. And so we see that uh, the, the point that Richard mentioned, that, uh, and which was accepted by the IMF, that the skilled wages basically rise faster than unskilled wages during the first period, but they fall massively during the second period. Then we look at uh, whether there is a change in, in the urban rural wage. Now in Chile, Chile has a very small proportion of labor in the agricultural sector, so it's not important. But in Ecuador it is. Then we look at changes in the, in the, in, in the genius of the other income sources, capital income, public transfers, and remittances. And we see that um, in the case of Ecuador, that remittances are equalizing which is not to be taken for granted because all the literature so far has said that they were un unequalizing. So basically it is what we have done for each one of these countries. And uh, this is again is a similar uh, decomposition done by two of the authors, uh, Caveman and Mauricio, Mauricio. And then basically it shows that the decline in uh, total uh, gene inequality, 73% is due to improvement in uh, labor inequality, 24% uh, in the case of Argentina, 24% to improvement in the distribution of pensions. Uh, during this period, public cash transfers are unequalizing and other non-labor incomes uh, are equalizing. So this has been done for about uh, uh, six countries. Uh, now, if you take the case of Brazil, it is interesting to see that you know the story of the Bolsa Escola, Bolsa Familia, is quite quite relevant because I mean, the Brazilian basically say that uh, the, this increase in transfers, like Bolsa Familia and Bolsa Escola and all that, explains about one fifth of the total decline of a huge decline in income inequality. So, like three points of Gini would have gone down because of uh, a small transfer, because the Bolsa Familia is very small. I mean, altogether, it's about less than 1% of GDP. So it looks like a, a miracle, you know. So we have been always been slightly unconvinced. But anyhow, this, are, this uh, other table confirms the results of the prior table. What are the overall the decomposition? Well, the, as I mentioned, is uh, uh, labor income uh, uh, falls. And then we say, well, in parallel to the decline of uh, labor income inequality, there is a decline in the skill premium. That uh, uh, we analyzed it uh, as closely as we could, but that, that is a rather complicated story. Well, it could be to the stagnant demand for uh, skilled labor. Basically, you have to build a supply demand of lab uh, skilled labor and unskilled labor. And in a way, one could, be, one could argue that there has been a rapid increase in income inequality because of uh, the uh, a major improvements in technology, I mean, adoption in te uh, sophisticated uh, technology during the 1990s, which somehow so, so levels off during the 2000s. This could be an explanation. Now, then, second, there is an increase in demand of, of unskilled laborers. Well, because why? Well, because there are policies increasing uh, uh, the demand for this type of labor, particularly in the trade sector, which means agriculture. And uh, if you look at some of this country, basically international commodity prices, they rose. And so the wages in agriculture, they rose because the demand for labor rose in agriculture. Some other people, they say that uh, the inequality, I mean, the decline of the skill premium has to do with the worsening quality of uh, the uh, higher education. So that the people who come out with a degree, they receive a lower wage in the, in the market because the universities are not as good as they were before, you know. Now, the, the one which we uh, tend to consider is the, the, the one which explains the most, in our view, is the one in red. So there is a rising supply of skilled labor due to higher spending on education in the 2000s and also in the 1990s, you know. And we'll come back to that. Now, the other point is that Latin America has gone through a, a very rapid demographic transition 
and an increase in, migra in em emigration. So that uh, if, if I have a greater proportion of young men and young women going to second and tertiary education, if some of them, they migrate, and the birth cohorts are smaller, then the supply of uh, unskilled labor is declining. And finally, institutional factors. Uh, I think that uh, minimum wages, and in Latin America, there is this, uh, I mean, the, the World Bank has produced interesting data showing that in Latin America, this uh, uh, lighthouse effect works. So that if I increase minimum wages in the formal sector, this uh, uh, spreads also to some degree to the informal sector. So this is the thing. Now, have we modeled, has anyone modeled uh, this uh, supply demand for skilled labor and unskilled labor so as to obtain, in the end, the skilled premium? It's very, very difficult to do because you don't really know what is the demand. You know what is the equilibrium point, I mean, you know the employment, but not the demand. So demand can be proxied in some ways, but it's not, uh, it's not simple. I mean, you don't, you don't have intentions of employers because, and so you have to use some proxies. Now, the interesting finding is that uh, this seems to be going back to the, Rolf, uh, going back to the 70s and, and, and 80s, that also the urban wage uh, gap is an important factor in reducing uh, in a total inequality. And that only in countries where, I mean, there is still a sizable uh, uh, supply, I mean, where the agriculture is still important. Then we have the transfers. Now, why should the transfer reduce income inequality? Well, because they are well targeted, but also because they've been financed with increased taxation. And, uh, and I think that what we'll see later is that uh, tax, uh, tax to GDP ratio have gone up quite a bit and because they are better targeted. Now, the other point is that uh, remittances, you know, remittances in the literature normally are treated as uh, unequalizing. So here we have the case of El Salvador, which is a country with a huge migration, out migration. One third of the Salvadorian are in Los Angeles. And you see that uh, the, the, the red line is the, the, the trend in the Gini coefficient uh, uh, before migration, excluding remittances and the other one, including remittances. And you see that uh, over time, the, the distance between the two rises from uh, three points to six points. So, which means that if the Naras go to Los Angeles to sell coca, probably this is equalizing in, uh, in, uh, in uh, the country of origin. Now, how about capital income? And now we know very little about that, and uh, this is one of the weakest point, and then, and I think that the debate uh, could be richardized in this. I mean, uh, we know, for instance, that Brazilians holding assets abroad are, I mean, they own something like about 200 billions of dollars. And this is money which has been uh, earned in good part in Brazil and belongs to Brazilian, but they don't pay taxes or very little taxes in uh, offshore places. And uh, so, uh, so if you include the income generated by that, we are not entirely sure what would come up. And uh, even the data, even the approach in which you correct the distribution of income by means of the tax returns, and they don't declare it in Brazil. So, so the one part of the f capital income may be escaping to offshore centers. And so if you calculate the Gini distribution by nationality, that may, may be different from the one which we found. So that uh, is uh, still uh, to be clarified. Now. So this is more or less what we find out with the decomposition. And the, the issue is that, uh, but why wage income goes up? Why this goes down? And so we found statistical data which are coming closer to our story. But then we don't know the, what are the, the political economy factors. So we say luck. So these are the five, the five possible explanations. We we'll go straight to them. Now, is luck equalizing? Well, if you look at term of trade rose, remittances rose, the financial bonanza improved. Now, what are, the, what are the distributive effects if you have an increase in the copper prices in Chile or Peru? Well, copper is produced in a sector with an extremely high uh, capital concentration. You know? So if you take the distribution, if you take the production function, it's very unequal because to, to dig mineral in, into the ground, basically you need a lot of machines and a little bit of labor. And the labor which is employed in the mining sector is normally highly qualified labor. You know? So uh, ex ante is unequalizing. You know? Now, how about finance? Was this financial bonanza improving uh, access to finance by the small guys? No, because uh, there was no changes in, in institutional approaches in the financial sector. You know? 
So, so basically, and then for the, for the remittances, perhaps because we saw it, that remittances in the six countries, the remittances are in three of them are unequalizing, and three of them are equalizing. So it depends where you are, you know. So the direct effects tends to be unequalizing. But then you have an indirect effect because, I mean, if you have terms of trade effect, I mean, you have an income effect in the national economy. The balance of payment improves. You can import uh, all the technology you want. Uh, you, you may create more jobs. You distribute more wages. And therefore, there is a, a growth effect, which we will see a, li a little later. But overall, ex ante, we discuss, we basically, we argue, I argue that uh, um, the financial balance, if anything, should be unequalizing because of the distribution of assets in the sectors which are producing these goods, basically. Now, uh, people, they argue, yeah, but then if you get um, a high bonanza, governments receive more revenue, you know? And this is true. So we plotted for all countries for 2003 and 2007 the relation between terms of trade on the horizontal axis and uh, uh, tax revenue to GDP on, on the vertical axis. And you see there is a very, very little relation. So the, the, the correlation coefficient is 0 0.18. So this is for 1990-2007. So if you take the period 2003-2007, it's very small, 0 0.18. So no correlation. So if you restrict the sample to um, the eight main commodity exporters uh, and only to the years 2003 and 2007, yes, there is, uh, so the correlation coefficient rises to 63, which if I remember correctly my statistics, uh, uh, basically is not an extremely high, is higher, but it's not uh, tre tremendously high. So even the, the, the fact that the Latin American countries have earned more revenues, which is important for many respects, is only in part, and only in a few of the countries, ca can be attributed to uh, um, commodity prices. Now, is it growth? So we said, well, international conditions, mm, no, not too convincing that, uh, like Ricardo Hausmann argues, that the source of decline of inequality comes from a good global environment. Is it the domestic growth which they had? Now, here, basically, we look at growth, and we see bilaterally, like in the chart with, uh, that Isabel showed, that we see that uh, the correlation are low, are low. The R squared, there is a totally, <laughs> practically all the variance is unexplained. But ex ante, does growth lead to inequality declines? Look at China. China is at, uh, until a year ago, basically a very fast rate of growth and a very fast rate of income inequality. So it's not the rate of growth which matters, but it's the pattern of growth, which is what we were saying when Rolf and I, we, we were wearing shorts, you know, here in the ILO. No. So those who argue that growth is this miracle that solves all the solutions, I mean, all the inequality problems, is basically false. It depends on the pattern of growth. And uh, so growth looks also an, an unlikely uh, thing. Now, the liberal policy changes, so the third solution, and I think that we should look at the political economy, so what we call the politics of policy changes. If you had a, a sort of a very conservative regime, would they have introduced policies which made more sense from the point of view of the poor? Unlikely. Uh, not because they are bad people, but because they reflect uh, the interest of uh, different social classes uh, and, uh, and perhaps they have closer ties to the international institution, international financial sector. So what we have in Latin America in the 80s, I mean, I lived uh, shortly in Chile in 1976 with General, Andre, El General Pinochet. And uh, uh, most of Latin America, Argentina, even uh, highly civilized Uruguay, they were military dictatorship, you know, Brazil, and so on and so forth. So in the 80s and 90s, there is a gradual return to democracy. Now, one rule, which is a very strange rule, when you come out of, a, of, a, uh, of an authoritarian regime, be it a sort of a, a Russian communism or a military dictatorship, the, the, political, the, the democratic political regimes which emerge are never center-left, never. I mean, so the Standikam Kandawire, our friend from UNRWA, Basically, so, so we have identified a sort of a transition period which may last six, seven, eight, 10 years, i.e. the period in which you introduce uh, neoliberal policies, 
Then you get fed up with them. You find out that distribution worsen. You find out that only few people benefit. You find out that employment does not rise very much. And then if you have democracy, then you vote against these people. And this is what has happened. In, uh, now, in Latin America, there is a survey, uh, uh, an ongoing survey, which is called the Latino Barometer, which uh, is a private institution based in Chile, which uh, collects information for, um, a significant, I mean, for a significant sample of the population of the region. And basically, it is very clear that people, they were against the, the privatization of telephones and water, that they thought that they, uh, all the economic policies uh, were benefiting uh, only a part of the country. All this uh, shift to the left is not that everybody has become Marxist or whatever, but basically, so there is no ideological realignment, but there is the fact that people uh, saw their own pockets, I mean, their own wallet shrink during the 80s and during the 90s. Now, if you have a regime which is elected, uh, uh, which is more favorable ideologically, and also because the social classes which express them, basically they want this type of things, then you will introduce policy, which will be imperfect, it will not complete, but they will go in this direction. And if you look at the history of political regime in Latin America, this is the one. You see that until, I mean, the turning point is late 90s, uh, and in this case it's 1998. The red ones are the center-left regime. The blue ones are the center-right regimes. And you see there is a very, there is a cross. And there, this is quite striking. And the center countries have remained more or less the same. So if you go back, we see that in the end, the inequality fell less, but also in a conservative regime. So there is a sort of a spillover effect also in this type of countries. Now, what is the story? What did they do? Well, they, they basically adopted a, a new macroeconomic regime. So they, they, they abandoned fixed pegs, which is the first thing. Second, they, had, um, they, they were in a way like the Washington Consensus, that the very prudent uh, uh, budgetary policies, they even had surplus, not, not primary surplus, a surplus for the region as a whole. Uh, they had the prudent monetary policy, and uh, so I say, but how did they finance this increase in expenditure? Well, because they taxed more. So they, basically, the tax GDP ratio rose by at least three, three, four points in the region, and in Brazil, nine points. So Brazil now taxes more than in the UK, uh, more than in Spain, more than, uh, and so, so basically the government has been collecting money and I think this has been a very important feature of their own new experiment. Now, if you, if you raise more money through, through the budget, basically you can increase public expenditure in a non-inflationary way. And there, there was a massive increase in social spending, particularly education and housing, I believe. Then the, 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 the policies, I mean, if you abandon, I mean, if you look at the standard the macro policy in a, in a neoliberal regime, this is, is very pro-cyclical. So when things go bad, you cut, which is completely crazy, including in Europe now. So we have to follow austerity in a period in which the economies are depressed. You should follow austerity in periods when the economy expands. But in periods in which the economy is depressed, I mean, if you take basic ISLM or uh, ASAD, basically, th then you have to use an expansionary policy. Now, I mentioned the exchange rate, which has been um, very much better. Then the other point, which in a way is, uh, tries to bring some uh, a smile on, uh, on the face of my pessimistic uh, uh, English friend here at the head table. I mean, basically, there has been a lot of uh, work being done in better prudential regulation of domestic banks. You know? And uh, now, why? The question is, it, uh, well, we don't, we don't really know. But you know, there is a sort of a committee of central bankers which, re which reviews. And so many, 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 many better, uh, better regulation of the domestic banking and financial sector. Why? Well, my guess is that they suffered from so many, so many crises, so many uh, financial crisis, I Mike, uh, that uh, basically, I mean, it made sense. I mean, they paid the very high prices. I mean, they, they, you know, they, there are some guys in, uh, I'm sure in the ILO, but also in the World Bank, who studied the, the cost of uh, uh, fixing the financial crisis of Ecuador, Argentina, and so on and so forth. I mean, it was immense and spread over several years. So perhaps uh, with the change in political regime, uh, they, uh, they started uh, trying to fix the problem. Now, there's been also a change in uh, one of the standard uh, uh, 
dependencies of the region, which is the dependence on foreign capital. Well, I mean, basically, if you take the, the financial assets, I mean, the deposits in central banks have gone up, and, and uh, uh, foreign debt owed by the country has declined. So the, the, the country say finally they came to have positive net financial assets towards the rest of the world. Now, what happens to the labor market? Well, I mean, I think here there are other things which are less uh, easy to document, but uh, there is a very interesting chapter by Kaifman and Maurizio. Well, first of all, I mean, if you look at the 80s and 90s, there has been a massive informalization of labor, which is what hap happens here. So the fear of the permanent secular stagnation, I mean, I, th I think that is, uh, and under consumption, I mean, this has clearly happened there, but there there's been an effort to correct that. So the share of labor, which was uh, not covered by contract, not covered by social security, basically started, has been deliberately being attacked in the region. So it's still very high, extremely high. And uh, in Latin American formalization is also into the formal sector of the economy. So you have large corporation who basically are labor without giving them a contract. Now, uh, uh, again, a uh, rise in the number of workers covered by collective contracts. In Argentina, they were telling me that uh, during the uh, Menem government, there were four people which were in charge of uh, uh, inspection against informal employment, four. And so how could, how could they cover a country so big? So now there are 300, perhaps there's still too few. Then the other thing which is, ten, tends to be equalizing is the recentralization of wage bargaining. And then there's been a massive increase in uh, minimum wages, which I'll show you in a moment, and an increase in social pensions in many parts of the, of the, re the region. So some of the efforts that uh, Isabel was mentioning in terms of social protection, I mean, the, case, the, mo the most obvious case are perhaps Argentina, but Bolivia. Bolivia had basically no social protection. And Devo has provided the $20 universal pension to everyone over 70 years of age. And all the valuation, they show that uh, these $20, they represent something like 50 or 60% of their own cash income. So it's very relevant, the intervention. Now, how about minimum wages? Uh, that uh, I think I, the ILO, these I'm sure are ILO data. Basically, if you look at the one in yellow, you see that in Brazil, the real so this is inflation corrected. Minimum wage rises from 114 to 182, so by 60-70%. In Argentina, it quadruples. In Uruguay, it's uh, more than doubles, uh, and so on and so forth. Now, me Mexico, Mexico no lo hace bien. Basically, Mexico uh, basically has a decline in the real minimum wages. Mexico, in fact, has a, a decline in income inequality, but not as pronounced as, uh, let's say, in the southern cone. Now, what happens to tax policy? This is what happens. So this is a tax GDP ratio in the three periods. So you see that you know the, the, the neoliberal tax reform that Isabel was mentioning before, basically uh, you see that GDP, tax GDP falls. Because, I mean, if you are in a period of crisis, tax GDP falls because there is tax buoyancy, negative tax buoyancy, it's just normal. And then you see that when the economy recovers, basically you go back to the long-term rate, which is about 15, 16%. But then during the 2008, this goes up by three points, which is quite a bit. And is it, uh, uh, is it uh, equitable, this uh, increase in taxation? Well, yes, it is. And uh, there is uh, one of these leaflets here is uh, the abstract of one of the chapters of this book, which I contributed to uh, prepare. And so if you ca calculate the reynolds smolensky index, which is the difference in Gini distribution before and after, you know? So now when uh, uh, it's negative, this means it's uh, basically is regressive. Taxation taxes more the poor than the rich. And so we did that on uh, very detailed studies for the 1990s and, and then for the 2000s. And then you see that, for instance, in the case of Argentina, taxation was regressive in the 1990s and becomes progressive in the, in the 2000s. And the change is huge. It's almost four Gini points, which means the tax system tends to become more progressive. And if you see that in the, in the 2000s, there is only, only Honduras which still, and El Salvador, which they still have a regressive taxation because they rely mainly on consumption taxes, value-added tax, you know, and excises. Now, uh, one of my PhD, who is the co-author of uh, this chapter, Bruno Martorano, did his thesis on uh, the new tax reform in Uruguay, where they reintroduced income tax. Uruguay, which normally people they think is the Switzerland of Latin America, 
or whatever else, basically at, they had completely abolished income tax you know, during the, the 1990s. And basically, we, it shows that basically there is no, no efficiency effect. I mean, because the idea is, okay, introduce taxes and people will no, go, no longer go to work, uh, the firms will no longer go invest. It's not, it's not true, basically. So there has been a deliberate uh, effort at raising taxes, and I think that the low taxation in Latin America was one of the main factors of uh, macroeconomic instability in the past. Now, so then what do you do with this money? Well, you, you increase public spending. You increase public spending on uh, uh, what? Well, mainly in the social sector. And you know, there are people who say, well, we have gone too far. Perhaps you should invest a little more in infrastructure. And I think that if you look at that, uh, uh, an interesting part of this, uh, an important part of this expenditure went into expanding secondary education. This is enrollment in secondary. So the blue bar, they give you uh, the increase in enrollment rates. So the first one, Uruguay, 1992 to 2005. Now, Uruguay had already a very high enrollment rate in secondary, so the increase is only five points. But if you look at the last one, which is Brazil, the enrollment rate increase in secondary education is more than 30 points. Now, what are the red bars? The red bar are the Q5, Q1 ratio. So is the is the ratio of the enrollment rate of the children belonging to the top 20% of the distribution to the children belonging to the top, to the bottom 20% of the distribution. So what do you see? Well, you see that in most cases, Q, Q1, uh, Q5, Q1 goes down. Though there still are a few, three, seven, but in 11, it goes down. So which means that the increase in enrollment is basically taking place among the children of the poor. So there has been a large increase in uh, educational enrollment uh, uh, among the in secondary educational enrollment among the children of the poor since the 1990. And if you take the data in the bottom part of the table, uh, you see that average spending on education for child 014, including kindergarten in real terms, uh, PPP, so it basically it gets multiplied by five. And if you take the share of GDP, which tells you a little even, even more, it goes up 2.8 to 4.4. Now, it's not uh, so simple to, the, to attribute that to policy. So Gasparini and Cruces in this volume, basically they've developed an algorithm and they basically conclude that 50% uh, is due to growth. So this increase in public expenditure because the government spends 2% of GDP, but GDP keeps growing, so you spend more money. Then second is that there is a cohort effect. So the number of children entering secondary education is basically slowing down. Why? Well, because the birth rate had fallen uh, 15 years before. But th at least 33% is due to policy. So which means that at least one part of this increase is driven by the desire to put the children of the poor into school. Now, if I increase public spending on education, particularly among the poor, uh, basically, I can compute on using Barrow and Lee data on the years of education of the labor force and other sources. I can compute the gene of education. So how nicely or how poorly distributed is the human capital stock among people, you know, among workers in particular. So you see that basically everywhere that there is a massive decline in, uh, in the gene inequality, which means there is a massive decline in the distribution of years of education of the labor force. And so that varies from, uh, of course, you see that the biggest decline are in countries where the enrollment rates were very low, so like El Salvador, which is the, the sharpest decline. But also Brazil. So in Brazil, it was a very segregated type of education, not many people. In Mexico. So basically, the in a very large increase in uh, education, uh, uh, secondary education particularly, improved the distribution of human capital which is a reproducible capital, which unlike the land, which is not reproducible. No? Now, if you look at social assistance, that the story is more or less well known. There has been an extension in social insurance. Uh, there has been an increase in conditional cash transfers. Um, now, the, there is a big debate. I have always been very uh, unconvinced by the Brazilians, by, uh, particularly by the um, what is the name? No, no, the, his name escapes me. But the argument that with 0 0.5 pies the bottle, by pies the bottle, who is the, now is the minister of uh, minister or deputy minister for social affairs, so his own views and his PhD is a top economist. You know, so the question is that if I take a distribution of income and I take the Lawrence curve and then I give 
a tax and I get 0.5% to the, to the bottom part. Well, the, the, distrib the, the distribution will go out a little, uh, will go in a little bit, you know, but not much, you know. So how could it be that with 1% of GDP I saved the, the uh, reduced so massively inequality? Well, this is what uh, Marcelo Neri says. Now, much of this money is given to people which are living in uh, outlying areas, rural areas, small cities, where the economy is very little monetized. So the, mu the multiplier effect, so if I give one, one uh, reich uh, to a poor family in a small village, basically the local GDP will increase by 1.78 points. And then they calculated that uh, uh, the multiplier effect for all the other types of uh, social transfer, and they see that, for instance, if you give it to the public servants, the effect is very small or is smaller than one. So. Now, uh, finally, I think that we should say, what did the new policy model in Latin America did not do? Well, first of all, there has been no major redistribution of assets. When I was spending time here with uh, Mike Hopkins, Rolf, Wouter, and so on, so on I mean, the, there was also uh, Keith Griffin here. And uh, I was very much uh, uh, influenced by his thinking, uh, by a book which I now have given to my PhD students on, called Poverty and Landlessness in Latin America and in Southeast Asia. And so Latin America still has uh, the latifundia, so it's still a very high land concentration. And uh, when uh, the leaders came to power, Lula in Brazil, um, in Paraguay, um, Lugo, in Bolivia, Evo, in Guatemala, I forgot which one, they, they all basically promised to redistribute the, the land. And I've been told these countries to, to look into that in particular. None of them delivered. None of them has delivered. Uh, and, uh, and there are many arguments which have been given, well, you know, now the population is urban, and then, and then basically it's politically very difficult to do. And now, ma mines, gas, oil, and, and oil fields, Bolivia is an exception, but also in that case, uh, very little nationalization. There is a nationalization of YFP in Argentina, but actually with compensation. So basically, uh, you, you get the mine, you get the, the, uh, the, the oil, but then uh, you give them five billions. Now, ac access to credit and finance for small orders. Hmm. And then university education. University education uh, remains uh, still uh, skewed, and uh, we'll see in the re recommendation. Now, industrial policy. I think that the country has been uh, abandoning, I mean, with an open trade regime. I mean, I, I'm more, I'm, I'm more assertive than Richard. I think that all the data I've seen, they tend to show that, by and large, trade, in the, trade liberalization in the periods in which you have trade liberalization is unequalizing. And there is a paper by uh, somebody in, uh, in, in American academia, I mean, very, very clear on that. So if, uh, if you do that, basically you do de-industrialize. And then I think that uh, one of the problem is that uh, rather than progressing uh, with their own industrial evolution, the region, uh, I mean, Argentina is a highly developed country, Brazil the same, uh, Chile the same, and so on and so forth. So, so rather than uh, witnessing a sort of further increase in the industrial base, then you see that uh, there, there's been a move towards financial services, uh, uh, return to, to agriculture, and uh, then uh, reduce dependence on foreign finance. Uh, now, I think that uh, Stephanie Griffith-Jones taught us that Countries with, uh, who basically, which basically finance uh, a larger proportion of their own uh, investments with domestic resources are more stable. <laughs> that is quite obvious. So, so there has been a lot of changes in the banking sector, good changes in the banking sector. In Brazil, there has been an increased role of the Banco Nacional de Desenvolvimiento, uh, while all the private sector was not lending. But... Um, uh, again, this is, we are far from uh, becoming uh, able to finance our investments entirely with our domestic savings, or at least a large proportion. So altogether, this has is is, is not been a radical model. This has been, uh, the, as, it, as it is defined in the literature, the social democratization of the Latin America. Now, the regression, without the regression analysis, I will save you that, but basically confirms what I told you. Now, let's look at the problems. This is, the, I mean, this is what still needs to be done. Then, uh, now, tertiary education, uh, university education. Now, changes in tertiary enrollment rates, you see that they have increased. But you also see that the Q5, Q1 ratios increase everywhere. 
And if you look at the, the political uh, uh, elections of, um, in Chile, I mean, the progressive regime, I mean, there was this uh, uh, student, very young students, like 23, leading the campaign of the opposition, basically saying to, uh, to the uh, center-left candidate and certainly to the center-right candidate, that basically you have to uh, expand access to tertiary education. Because if we do have uh, further technological shocks, Basically, we will go back as before. So the wages of the skilled laborers will go up, the wages of the unskilled laborers will remain where they are. And the, when I, I was in Chile in uh, January, and uh, basically I'm told that the government has targeted a 3% increase in taxation, basically on uh, increasing corporate income tax, mainly, to finance uh, a broader access to education. In addition to that, you have to finance the strengthening of public secondary school, which are of lower quality. In Italy, it's the opposite. In Italy, if you go to a private school, it means you don't want to study. But in, uh, in Chile, basically, and in large part of Latin America, uh, the private schools, they prepare better the students. And then entering the university is via competition. I mean, I don't know whether it's true everywhere, but in a large part. The second problem is that if you look at that, if you, if you draw a sort of a... Uh, if you calculate what should be the, the taxation norm in, rela in relation to GDP per capita, and that's done on all countries, eh? not only the Latinos, you see that with the exception of Argentina, Brazil, and Nicaragua, all the others are below the international norm. So we still have a, 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 a need to increase taxation, and we have done a little bit of regression analysis, basically showing that if you increase direct, direct taxation on GDP by one point, Gini falls by 0 0.9 to 1.2 points. And if you reduce uh, excises by uh, one point, this Gini will improve by, because you know, they, they have a very bad incidence, by 0 0.9 points. That's it. So lots of still needs to be done, but I think that we have uh, a sort of a, an anti picketing antidote. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh